Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for welcoming me into this session on ocean-based negative emissions technologies. My name is David Koek, and I'm the Science Director of Ocean Visions. Ocean Visions is a new nonprofit seeking to catalyze solutions for ocean health by enhancing the connectivity and exchange of ideas between academic and research institutions and the civil society partners needed to scale the ideas. Today, I would like to provide an overview on artificial upwelling, a review of the technology, critical risks and obstacles, ongoing progress in the field, and remaining questions that must be answered in order to decide whether artificial upwelling will or will not play an important role in meeting the gigaton scale carbon dioxide removal necessary to stabilize and ultimately reverse planetary warming. At the end of my talk, I will share with you some of the work that Ocean Visions is doing to drive progress in this field of ocean-based negative emissions technologies and how you can help. Let's start by defining artificial upwelling. It is the process of engineering upward vertical transport to move deep water into the mix layer. There are several reasons you might consider doing this. For instance, to bring cool deep ocean water to the surface to counteract warm surface waters or to hypoxinate, excuse me, or to oxygenate hypoxic deep ocean waters. But for the purposes of this session, we should really think about artificial upwelling as a technology to fertilize the euphotic zone with macro and micronutrients in order to enhance primary production. This will enhance export out of the mixed layer, which will allow the ocean to take up more atmospheric carbon dioxide, a negative emission or carbon dioxide removal. For the rest of the talk, I will use carbon dioxide removal, understanding that this word is interchangeable with negative emissions. Why do we need to reach deep into the ocean for nutrients? As a reminder, most of the surface ocean is depleted of macronutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus, as well as micronutrients such as iron that are needed to support biological production. In contrast, the deep ocean is replete in these nutrients. If we can tap into the deep ocean, we can reach a near limitless supply of additional nutrients to support biological production and ocean-based carbon dioxide removal. I'd like to spend a moment thinking about where artificial upwelling falls on the taxonomy of ocean-based carbon dioxide removal approaches. Artificial upwelling should really be thought of as a sub-approach of biotic pathways. Fundamentally, these technologies enhance production of macro or microalgae. Some take advantage of excess nutrients in the coastal zone to support growth. Others rely on surface application of nutrients to stimulate production. Ocean iron fertilization is probably the best known example here. There are a number of emerging technologies that seek to depth cycle macroalgae to take up nutrients below the uh, nutric line and return the macroalgae to the sunlit surface layer to support growth. And then there's artificial upwelling, which pumps nutrient-rich deep ocean water to the surface to support biological production. So artificial upwelling is really a subdomain of biotic pathways and should be considered as such. There are, of course, abiotic pathways that seek to enhance the ocean's alkalinity and hence its ability to store carbon. You will hear from folks talk about, uh, talking about these abiotic pathways as part of this session. Enhanced production is the first of two required parts of the story. Newly fixed organic matter must be sequestered on long time scales in order to prevent its return to the atmosphere and allow the ocean to take up additional carbon dioxide. There are a number of sequestration options displayed here. Today, I will focus on the challenges of artificial, excuse me, uh, today I will focus on the challenges and opportunities of artificial upwelling but I want the audience to keep in mind that artificial upwelling without reliable sequestration pathways is unlikely to yield sustained carbon dioxide removal. Artificial upwelling has been studied as a technology now for several decades. This nice review from Panadol shows the dates of various field trials, some even going back into the 1980s. The vast majority of these field trials have been very short in duration, think hours to days, and the open ocean deployments have mostly required very close supervision. Nonetheless, several of these field studies were able to show enhancements in primary production due to artificial upwelling. 
None of these studies were focused on carbon dioxide removal potential. So there has been no documented enhancement of oceanic uptake of atmospheric carbon dioxide as a result of these small scale field trials. Over the last 10 plus years, there have been a number of Earth system modeling studies that have attempted to quantify carbon dioxide removal from a global scale deployment of artificial upwelling devices across a very large portion of the global ocean. In these two studies, we can see the estimated range of carbon dioxide removal where it varied from less than, uh, less than zero gigatons of carbon dioxide removal annually to greater than three gigatons of carbon dioxide removal annually. Continuing on, the study on the left actually showed negative carbon dioxide removal because the simulated transport of deep ocean waters to the surface elevated surface ocean PCO2 more than the expected PCO2 drawdown from nutrient fertilization. So this highlights one of the central questions with artificial upwelling. Will nutrient fertilization induce biological production that draws down more CO2 uh, than the CO2 is elevated from the outgassing of CO2 rich deep ocean waters or vice versa? And the answer to this question really lies at the heart of determining the efficacy of artificial upwelling for carbon dioxide removal. And then finally on the right, the Keller et al. study suggests much higher rates of carbon dioxide removal potential from a global scale deployment of an artificial upwelling network. So overall, there's a lot of variability in the modeling studies and they range from less than zero gigatons of carbon dioxide removal annually to possibly more than 10 gigatons of carbon dioxide removal annually. Here, I am showing a compilation of artificial upwelling field and modeling studies displayed as functions of their maximum length of upwelling and their volumetric flow rate. So the maximum length is on the x-axis here and the volumetric flow rate is on the y-axis. And the field trials are shown as purple circles and the modeling studies are shown as orange triangles. And I think this plot does a really good job of illustrating that there's a big gap between the field studies that have been constrained to shallow waters with low flow rates and often for short periods of time with the modeling studies that have been simulated in deployments that are much deeper and at much higher flow rates. And so this plot shows that how we treat upwelling in models has exceeded our technological capacity to deploy upwelling devices currently. And this gap matters because we can think of carbon dioxide removal potential from artificial upwelling as equal to the upwelling rate, that is how much water is transported per unit time, times the expected change in surface ocean carbon dioxide concentration as a result of upwelling. So when the model flow rate exceeds our current technological capacity, we can run the risk of overestimating the near-term carbon dioxide removal potential in models. Now, for the rest of the talk, I would like to discuss some of the challenges and opportunities to advance the state of knowledge around artificial upwelling. One of the most important consequences of artificial upwelling is that engineered upward transport must be met by compensating downflows because water is incompressible. These downflows will be distributed over a greater radial area, but the volumetric flow will be equal due to the incompressibility of water. The same is true in the reverse direction. If you artificially downwell water, you would generate a compensating upwelling. And there are many risks from this enhanced mixing between the surface mixed layer and the deeper waters as a result of artificial upwelling. The largest risk is that of accidentally releasing deep ocean CO2 and creating negative carbon dioxide removal either as a direct result of upwelling or as an indirect consequence of the compensating flows which could weaken the thermocline and allow for greater mixing across the thermocline. So this diagram on the right shows the relative size of the ocean carbon, of, excuse me, of the deep ocean carbon inventory compared to that of the surface ocean and the atmosphere. We can see that the deep ocean reservoir is much larger and therefore has, a, has the potential to outgas substantial quantities of CO2 to the surface ocean and atmosphere. A second consequence of artificial upwelling or second potential consequence is, is the potential to modify sea surface temperature, which can then change circulation patterns and weather systems. 
And given the chaotic nature of weather systems, it's very difficult to foresee all the consequences of such modifications to our global circulation systems. There are some efforts underway to understand some of the key science questions about the bioge biogeochemical and ecological impacts of artificial upwelling. So I'd like to draw everyone's attention to the European Union's Ocean Art Up program, which has conducted a number of mesocosm studies to evaluate the impacts of artificial upwelling on marine plankton communities. With an express interest in considering how artificial upwelling may be used to enhance food security. Although carbon dioxide removal was of secondary interest in this research program, many of the programs and findings are applicable to both pursuits. Now, results are emerging from Ocean Art Up, and you can read about them in this open access ebook. One of the biggest challenges around ocean based carbon dioxide removal are the challenges around monitoring and verification. That is, how can we verify that additional CO2 was taken up and that it remains safely sequestered for long periods of time? The ocean is variable, both in time and space, and estimates of additionality need to account for this variability. This is especially important for artificial upwelling, where there's a high risk of outgassing CO2 as a consequence of the upwelling. So the global array of current ocean observing systems and platforms, including biogeochemical biogeochemical argo floats shown on the left here could become powerful tools to help monitor for additionality and to verify permanence. As I mentioned earlier in the talk, most of the field trials of upwelling devices have focused on a single device for a short period of time with a high degree of human supervision. But to reach gigaton scale carbon dioxide removal, we will need a series of advances in autonomous operations, monitoring, and maintenance that allow networks of upwelling devices to operate autonomously in the open ocean in an environmentally safe manner for long periods of time with minimal to no human supervision. This will require scientists and engineers working together to accelerate the technological development of these devices. There are also a number of additional scaling considerations for artificial upwelling beyond science and engineering alone. These include whether or not artificial upwelling will interfere with existing marine industries, such as shipping and fishing. And if so, it's likely to face a steeper climb to reach public acceptance. Another important consideration is whether or not artificial upwelling, coupled with artificial downwelling, runs afoul of marine dumping conventions. And finally, Artificial upwelling, as envisioned by a series of long pipes and pumps, is a very materials heavy process. So how does placing all of this uh, material in the ocean intentionally affect public support for the process and for that more uh, broadly for ocean-based carbon dioxide removal? In these last few minutes, I want to share with you the work that Ocean Visions is doing to catalyze a worldwide community of scientists, engineers, innovators, entrepreneurs, conservationists, philanthropists, and more to make progress on advancing the research and development of ocean-based carbon dioxide removal technologies, including artificial upwelling. Over the past year, Ocean Visions has led 189 participants from 23 countries on six continents through a crowdsourced effort to build digital living technology roadmaps to accelerate the testing and development of ocean-based carbon dioxide removal technologies. These roadmaps will allow for interested actors to work together on key priorities and for authorized users to continue to update and amend the maps as progress is made. They currently reside on a beta platform with the URL shown here on the right, and they're gonna to migrate to the Ocean Visions website shortly. I encourage you to explore them. In the macroalgae cultivation and carbon sequestration roadmap, which is currently live on the beta platform, we highlight science and engineering needs around the design and testing of artificial upwelling to support macroalgae cultivation. You can navigate through the map and read about additional obstacles, needs, and, pri and first order priorities. And more importantly, in the coming months, we will in introduce functionality to this platform 
that allows a global community of experts to join together to advance the roadmaps as key advances are made, obstacles are overcome, and key needs are unlocked. We hope that community involvement will keep these roadmaps at the cutting edge and continue to focus people and resources on the most critical challenges to advance the research and development of ocean-based carbon dioxide removal technologies. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to participating in the additional parts of this session.